There's so wonderful presentations. <laughs> I'm um, keeping with my book. My book. Um, I'm um, very honored and pleased to be here. Thank you, Aldi, for inviting us here. And um, thank you, Your Excellency, for welcoming us in this wonderful place. Uh, my talk will go rather in the direction of memory. And um, therefore, I've chosen to uh, choosing to talk about Gorgon's time um, because I think that in the story of Medusa we have um, a very special form of time that up to a point freezes. So. Um, um, what I would like to prove here is that the Gorgons have just one kind of time, would be the present, and that is a sort of operaic <laughs> perspective that what hides Medusa is in fact tenderness. So Medusa is a tender creature. I'm starting with this image that you will find in um, the um, Museum of Archaeology. You can see the uh, entrance from Athens. And you can see here the face of Medusa. But it's not looking so monstrous, but rather tender. Um, I will have a starting point trying to see because uh, this time as memory, it's linked for me always to, uh, always to the image, to the site. And therefore I have tried to ask myself, which are the most in interesting examples of sites that we can find in uh, the Greek mythology. And of course, one is Medusa, her gaze that petrifies, that transforms into the stone. And on the other side, is another creature that is called Panoptes, the one that sees everything. And of course, it's Argus. You can see here a detail for a painting with Argus. And you can see that the whole skin of Argus is filled with ices. And what do I want to underline that these creatures that have both something in common are displaying a different way of um, making memories, of seeing and turning life into memory. Um, to discuss about Argus, uh, it's a very interesting reference, a text by Michel Spear, that is discussing about the iconography of his Argus, like the like an insomniac, like somebody that has no blind spot. He has this a total view surrounding the view, um, it lives intensely the present. He never sleeps, as we know, because his eyes are sleeping one by one. And therefore, it's interesting that Michel said that was a sailman once, it's comparing Argus, the guardian. We remember that Hera was sending Ardus, Argus to take care of um, a nymph that um, Zeus was loving and she was transforming her into a, um, a heifer, into a small cow. And therefore she was sending Argus to take care of her, to, to supervise. So this is Argus, the all seer. Um, he, 
um, is put there by Hera to see all over and to, to stop Dio for getting close. Of course, Dio was, was um, sending, was not accepting this, was um, sending Hermes that with the um, with the music, with the pan flute, it's um, sending Argus into the, the eyes of Argus into the sleep, and then uh, he cuts his head. It's the same thing that is happening with Medusa, we remember. And just to compensate, Hera, you can see here, it's picking the eyes from the skin of Argus and he puts <coughs> the eyes on the tail of the peacock. What is happening here, basically the old seer becomes decorative. The eyes are no longer seeing, they are just beautiful, they are an object of seeing, they have to be uh, contemplated but these eyes are no longer functional, they are blind. So here you can see yes, the whole image with um, Hermes playing the flute in order to sleep uh, into the sleep um, Argus. What, ha uh, what is happening here? We have this pure gaze total gaze, this massive eyeball, as Michel says, shows, that it's all seeing and that it's falling asleep and then this whole eye is becoming only uh, decorative. Um, so, just to remember, yes, uh, Argus, the Panopte, uh, is the one that is only decorated. On the other side, we have Medusa with another kind of sight, a deadly sight, uh, a sight that is kept buying it, turning the others into Stuff. Let's look a little bit of the eyes of Medusa in the eyes of Medusa. And what we will find here is, and, and uh, the eyes of Medusa are a sort of iconographic model or uh, um, image that is always circulated. And as you will see further, uh, the image of Medusa because of these eyes is becoming a sort of amulet. But let's look a little bit at, uh, at her genealogy. Medusa was not always a monster. She was born as a wonderful, as a beautiful uh, girl. But she was born um, out of um, horses and chato, uh, which both have been um, sort of creatures of the sea. Portis is a monster. Um, he has, as you see, this tail of a fish and um, he's mixing the images of different creatures of the ocean. And he <coughs> is getting married with her sister. What is coming out of these creatures are a series of monsters, uh, a series of monsters that are somehow connected with the story of Medusa, because uh, before the Gorgons, the three Gorgons, the two a brother and sister, are giving born birth to um, other interesting creatures, the three Grie, which are born as old women. And here is an interesting relation with the time and um, 
I was very interesting to connect with the presentation of Christina because we have this iconography of all time old. Yes, this gray woman's ball, born gray and living as the this gray witches. Then is another serpent, half woman, half uh, snake. Then, because here we have several parents attached to the creatures, are the Hesperide, which are the nymphs of the evening, of the golden light of the evening, the Sphinx, the Nemean lion. Um, for this, sometimes we are getting other parents in the mythology, but uh, there are authors that are relating them to the horses and the um, but. Um, I think it's important to understand better the image of the three gorgons. Out of which, of course, Medusa is the smallest and the only mortal one, which I think is very important because the other two sisters are immortal. One of them, Steno, it's the one full of force. It's the eldest of the Gorgon, it's depicted with grass hands. And uh, of course, as all of them with these strong teeth and think that she was killing most of the people. Then it comes the Euryale, the one with a very strong voice. And it's interesting that, that it's told them uh, when she was crying and she was crying um, seeing Perseus cutting the head of Medusa, uh, the stones of the people turned into yeah, rocks by her gaze were just turning into the sand. So she's going further in this deconstruction. And of course, Medusa. And here we have a very special use of Medusa's um, head because of his, the power of his eyes, we have this Gorgoneion, which is in fact an amulet, because as you know, after Perseus was cutting the head of Medusa, Athena is taking an image of her head as her own effigy. As when Zeus was wearing the effigy of this protecting head of Medusa. And here somehow the circle is getting round because the name of Medusa is the guardian. So the one that it's protecting. And it's again a paradoxical situation. Why this monster that is turning into stone, it's really protecting. Okay, we have this pharmacon that up to a dose is good and <laughs> with overdose can be, can be dangerous. But I think that it's something more than this that explains the real uh, way um, Medusa is becoming part of uh, our mythology. And I'm coming back here. Um, it's a, uh, I'm using a, a reference of it as uh, I was telling you, I finally different readings of uh, Medusa's identity story and so on. And uh, um, I'm using all this metamorphosis for this. Uh, and as you remember, she was a beautiful woman. And what was, uh, she was serving in the temple of Minerva, of uh, Athena. Um, and Neptune was falling in love with her. He was coming to the uh, temple to rape her. In this moment, uh, Minerva is turning the beautiful maid into a monster. And I think this is the moment that is the uh, most interesting. And it's the most interesting connected with the story of uh, the death of Medusa. 
And here, uh, and I think right here, we can see the relation and the, the way the time is conceived in the story of Medusa. What we have here, we have the killer of Medusa, we have Perseus, together with Andromeda. Uh, by the way, he's telling the story of the way he has killed Medusa at his wedding with Andromeda. And what we have up there, and it's very interesting because somehow it resembles the motif of Narcissus, yeah, because do this double head. We have the head, the beheaded Medusa, kept up by uh, Perseus. And then we have her reflection. Her reflection, not in the shield of Athens, but in the sort of water. It's very important to understand this in um, uh, in the perspective of the story of Perseus, because Perseus was also a result of a seduction. <coughs> Zeus was falling like a golden rain over, over the body of Danae, of Danae, and she was getting pregnant with Perseus. Just remember, Danae was kept closed by her father <coughs> because an oracle was telling that uh, the son, her son will kill her father, so his grandfather. So therefore, Danae has forced to run away with the kid, with Perseus. He was arriving in an island where the king was falling in love with <clears throat> Danae. <clears throat> At a party, um, Perseus was invited and because he couldn't pay with horses, was the rule to pay with horses the invitation, he was telling the king that he can give him anything. And therefore the king was sent in Perseus to kill Medusa knowing that everybody that is meeting Medusa will die. Why? Just to have access to Danae. What is happening? Perseus is going and with a sort of instrument from uh, the other deities, with the shell of Athens, with the um, a sort of cup, given by Hades that make him invisible and so on, he managed to kill uh, Medusa. And when he's coming back with the head of Medusa, he's seeing that his mother was already the victim of the king. What means all of this? <coughs> it means that Leaving his mother alone, <coughs> Perseus' role as the guardian <clears throat> of his mother is destroyed. Therefore, he turns uh, basically Danae into a gorgon because she was raped by the king as Danae was raped by uh, Jupiter. As a result, what is killing Perseus? Perseus is killing somehow Danae because in this shell of Medusa, where the gaze of the Medusa is reflected, basically this mirror is mirroring two stories which are somehow identical and Danae with her story, raised by the king of the island, is Medusa. So, therefore, uh, in this story, Perseus, that was basically the guardian of his mother, is no longer the guardian of his mother. Medusa is acquiring this name of guardian, but it's a useless one because yeah. And Perseus finds
finally get his real name. Perseus means the one that wakes, destroys, sucks. Why this wonderful hero is wearing such a name? Because he is healing and ravishing his mother. So going back to the moment when uh, Medusa is turned into a mon monster, it's very interesting that we have a different way of conceiving, but um, most of the researchers are talking about this seduction because there are also interpretations when she was agreeing the relation with nothing. But um, um, Ovid, Ovid, it's going in the direction that she was seduced by Nathan. And what I think it's rendering best, the story of Medusa, is this image of Caravaggio, which basically is a self-portrait. But the question is what we are seeing in this image. Uh, the official interpretation is that in this image, we are seeing Medusa in the moment when Perseus is coming to cut her head. But I think that what we are seeing, in fact, is also the moment when Medusa is raped by Neptune. Because basically these moments are overlapping in the imagery of Medusa. The eyes are not turned toward us. They are looking aside because looking at us means killing us. But like this, in this interesting, very interesting self-portrait by Caravaggio, Medusa is overlapping the two traumatic moments, the moment of her turning into a Medusa, leaving aside her beautiness, and the moment of death. So, the question, what case is Medusa? It's ne Neptune raping her. Is her lost beauty? Is her maculation? It's death. And I think here, all these three answers are right because in the end, her maculation, her raping are all leading to death. And this gaze that is going directly into the death is the gaze that turns the other into death too. Um, this is a quote from... Um, um, Caravaggio. As a conclusion, uh, in my opinion, this image of Caravaggio is the very moment when Medusa is gazing her own seduction, is gazing her own death, and therefore becomes a deadly ape. And I want to remember you that after cutting her hair, her head and going um, with her head away, there is a very special moment um, rendered by Ovidius in book 14, when after killing the monster that was um, uh, threatening Andromeda, he washes his hands after the uh, victory, and then she's taking Medusa head, and he is putting leaves on the ground, and he is placing the head of Medusa on these leaves. And I think this gesture has so much tenderness and so much loving in it that. Uh, somehow 
anticipate the moment when he's coming back with Medusa, seeing that her mother was raped and that Medusa is somehow like his mother. And what is happening then, and I think this is also amazing, beautiful, is that the nymphs are gathering um, plants for the water from the way, and then putting close to Medusa, these are turning into corals. Just think of the beauty of the corals. Just think at the chorus like the veins of blood. Just think, think of this overlapping of pain, of trauma, of killing, of death, and <coughs> of beautiness and tenderness. Because just imagine these nymphs gathering and putting them near Medusa to turn them into corals. It's like putting flowers near the dead. So therefore, what I think is that in the end, the time of Medusa, which also called the Gorg, has no direction. Basically, she's immobilized in this moment when Neptune has seduced her. It was cutting her life, was cutting her beautiness, has maculated everything. He was stopping there in this moment of trauma that is like gazing in the eyes of the dead. And therefore, the, the gaze of Medusa is becoming so par powerful. Uh, therefore, uh, her gaze that was seeing death is transforming the others into the dead, or into death as a revenge, but also as a protection, because she shouldn't be seduced anymore. And basically, what is also very interesting is that her sisters, the Gorgons, were also beautiful, and they are turning into ugly monsters in the same time. And I think this is giving a wonderful image of the whole family receiving this pain of this transformation, this transformation from the trauma. And basically, this trauma is getting into a permanent presence, a permanent presence that is similar to death, because death is also a sort of permanent presence. Um, here I was, because I was try, trying to go further, it's very interesting that for finding the place of the Gorgons and for killing the Gorgons, Perseus was going to the old woman, his Gargane, and these old women were all of them having just one eye that they were giving from one to the other in order to see and also in order to go. And Perseus was stealing this eye. But I think this is also very interesting because Perseus was able to get to this place of trauma, was able to get to the place of Medusa just by stealing this detachable eye and after, in order to get the eye back, they were telling where Medusa is now living. And just think about this community of sisters, because all of them have been sisters, in relation with this traumatic experience of Medusa. And oh, Ajunge, am terminat. Nu, 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 n
for Baku. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, so coming back to the story, so the, this detachable eye is taking pursuit there where the trauma is and where the trauma is synonym with death and where this kind of traumatic memory is freezing time. Uh, I have a lovely conclusion, but I can't get it, get to it, let's see, uh, or not, yeah, uh, is this one? Uh, it's a lovely quote from a Romanian philosopher, and somehow this quote was um, telling us that always we have to look at the name of the character. When Teti is taking care, is loving his son Achille, he's uttering all his name. Uh, uttering the name of Medusa as guardian, we can understand that by this trauma, by his, her access to death, she was really becoming a sort of amulet able to protect us because she was seeing the trauma. <rire> je remercie Alexandra Pachon, comme je viens, euh, j'avais dit au, au début, on garde les questions pour la fin. On voit que notre parcours est parti de l'apocalypse est passé par le temps des, des icônes euh, des églises pour arriver de nouveau au temps mythique de Gordon et maintenant on revient euh, à notre époque avec la présentation de Sébastien Chenavé, une figure mythique pour éclairer la recherche en rhétorique la figure de Cassandre et l'analyse des discours contemporains des gens militants écologistes.